second commemoration of the Crystal Knock. Oh. That was when the, in 1938, November 9th, the Nazis went into, they destroyed more than 1,400 synagogues, dragged thousands of people off to concentration camps, and they call it Crystal Night because a lot of those Jews had crystal shops. And they went in and smashed that all up and destroyed millions of dollars worth of their goods. And uh, it was the beginning of the Holocaust. Yeah. And uh, so all over the world, Jews were, last night, left their lights on all night to commemorate that, that time 82 years ago. 82. So I was just two years old, going on three at that time. So I didn't know anything about it. But later on, when I got into elementary school, they started telling us about what was going on over there. But we still didn't understand. It was many years before I finally got the idea of what really happened. But boy, yeah, sometimes things just pass you by. Yeah. And you know, if you're a kid, you don't really take it in or. It, if it yeah. doesn't affect you now directly. These, these, most of these modern kids are never even told anything. They don't know anything about it. Never even heard of it. Well, you know, it's just, it's weird in history. I consider when I was in high school and college, yeah. I consider myself up on the news. Yeah. And uh, there was something that happened when I was in Ukraine, and I started digging into some old old uh, some old ideas and I started looking up history you know my own contemporary history things that was going on in my world that I really didn't know much about yeah and Jim I my heart was extremely heavy um, because I had missed so much stuff that yeah. was really like for instance uh Darfur and um, some of the things that happened in Bosnia Herzegovina. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of that happened under the Clinton administration. And, you know, I remember hearing a little bit about it, but not much. And I certainly never saw like a documentary saying, this is what's going on, y'all. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, tens of thousands of people were, um, What do you call it? Racial cleansing? Yeah, Racial eth cleansing? Ethnic, ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, for that to go on in our day and age, it's it's staggering. Well, but what it is there does. about our day and age that makes it any more holy than any other day That's and age right. ever been? I mean, because... You know, ever since Cain killed Abel, the enemy had been trying to wipe out the Lord's people. Yeah. And, of course, the beauty of it all, though, is that Lord's people are under the covenant with God, and that's not going to happen. Although yeah. the enemy never seems to give up on it. Yeah, that's right. You know, Revelation speaks of a time when, uh, and this is something that Evangel could argue about, but you have these two witnesses that are in Revelation. Yeah. And uh, it says uh, the enemy killed him. And they were left, they wouldn't bury him. They let him lay publicly in the streets and people danced around him and celebrated. The whole world went into worldwide celebration. They finally killed these two. And the, I heard taught that it was Moses and Elijah. I don't believe that for a second. I think who they killed was the Lord's people because the two represents the Lord's people. Mm -hmm. And of course, ever since the beginning, the enemy had been, been trying to destroy the Lord's people. And he's killed him by the millions, millions and millions have died. But every time somebody dies, the Lord just raises up another. You know, when Cain killed Abel, then Seth was born. Seth means literally God has raised up another. Another what? Yeah. And another what it was, another head crusher, because the Lord had said, her seed will crush your head. Yeah. And so here was uh, Seth raised up. And then, of course, the enemy keeps on going, killing more and more and more and more and more. But no matter how many he kills, they just keep coming back. 
and so the enemy is frustrated because he can't seem to get them. But in Revelation where it says those two witnesses were there and they killed them, and then the whole world went into celebration. And the reason is why is because they could say, we finally got them. Now they're destroyed. Yeah. So if the Lord's people are destroyed, then what would happen to God? Well, he wouldn't have any people. Well, he wouldn't have any people. His covenant would have failed. Yeah. So what does that do to him? Makes him a failure. Makes him a failure. And if God's a failure, then everything is finished, isn't it? Yeah. And if he's the failure, then the only the only one who won is the enemy. And so the world goes into celebration thinking we finally got him. Now we will be the God. Mm -hmm. But suddenly after three days, the two witnesses suddenly stand back on their feet because the Lord raised them up. And so... The enemy thought he had destroyed them, but it's all of a sudden he finds they're back on their feet again. And my belief is that it'll come out when it's all done. The enemy will discover he never even got one of them. <laughs> he never got Abel. He never got any of the others. And all the way down through the history of the world, the enemy thought he got them because they were laying there dead. Yeah. But suddenly they all stand, who stands on their feet? All the Lord's right, people, everyone. Yeah. And the enemy will realize he's a total loser. He lost everything. Mm. And that's how I see that. I can't for a minute believe it was just two men, Moses and Elijah. I think it was all the Lord's people. And what has the enemy been trying to do? Moses and Elijah died centuries ago, but the enemy did not celebrate their death because mm -hmm. there was more to replace them. But when these two died, there was nobody left to replace them. So if all the Lord's people died, then who was left? There wouldn't be anybody. So that's the reason why the enemy goes into celebration. But he won't celebrate for long. You know, it says they raised up in three days. And, of course, in three days, somebody's dying. So what died in the three days? Lord's people? No. They're already dead, but they'd be resurrected. But there's something that dies going to stay dead. Oh. It's the hope of the enemy. Uh. <laughs> His determined effort to destroy. That will die and that will stay dead. And, uh, of course, when those two, which I think represents the Lord's people, when they are resurrected, the enemy just suddenly goes. In, in fact, their, their celebration turned into terror. Mm -hmm. They're just absolutely terrorized. What, what are they afraid of? What what made them terror, terrorized is the almighty God who resurrected his people. Yeah. And thrown the enemy into terror. That will come. Hadn't happened yet, but it's on the way. And so we can be glad for that. But these uh, Jews all over the world left their lights on last night. It's, of course, uh, in Israel, November 9th started yesterday not today but so all night they left their lights on to commemorate the crystal knock there's still quite a few survivors of the holocaust that, are, that have they're all real old 9900 years old most of them are close to that but there's still some of them around but there's still those fools who claim that none of it ever happened you know yeah i mean how could anybody even think about denying that? would be like saying, you know, Columbus never came to cross the Atlantic or World War II never occurred or something. I mean, what are you going to do? You'd have to be mindless to even think that way. But I used to know some people in Anchorage. I didn't realize when I knew them that they were Nazis. They're really nice folks to talk to. But they said one night that the Holocaust never happened. Really? They claimed it was all a fake made up by the Jews, okay. that Anne Frank was not real, and that the, the so-called Anne Frank diary was written with a ballpoint pen, they said, which hadn't been invented yet. Huh. And, uh, you know, they come up with all kinds of stuff like that. But anybody who ever was there, tell them it never happened and ask them to answer that. They knew it happened. Yeah, there's too much evidence. Yeah. Well, you know, this yesterday we were looking at the number uh, eight. Yeah. And remember what the Hebrew word for eight is? Uh, 
It was Het. No. Het is, uh, well, that's the letter eight, the eighth letter. Ah. But the number eight is called another word. Yeah, I don't know it. <laughs> Shimone. Shimone? Shimone. Yeah. And it's spelled Sheen Mem Noon. That's how the word is spelled, Shimone. And of course, Sheen means it's a, a, a abbreviation for El Shaddai, God Almighty, the great power and the great provider. What is Mem? Mem. I don't know. It's water. Water, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. And noon means new beginnings. So Shimone really means Almighty God, El Shaddai, supplies us with water, which of course is living water, and that produces new beginnings or new life. <laughs> so that one word, Shimone, number eight, is a, a very abbreviated gospel, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Almighty God provide living water, and that gives us new beginnings, a new <laughs> birth. So just that one word, eight, means, or the letter, or the number eight, means this, the salvation of the Lord, of, of the Lord's people. So so uh, that's, that's so good, you know. You, and I was saying, you know, in our Western language, all eight is just a mean of a number in accounting or something, yeah. you know, eight eight books or eight cars parked there or eight houses on that block or whatever. But other than that it has no meaning, whatever. It doesn't mean nothing, you know. Gotcha. But here in Hebrew it means the salvation of God. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> That's nice. And uh Um You got your cup? Uh yeah. Be right there, somewhere it is. Yeah. Ooh, it was hot and steamy. Oh, Jim, I forgot your cream. It's all right. We'll take it the, take without it, cream today. We'll, dark, just, huh? we'll just not worry about cream. Well, shoot, I'm sorry. That's all right. I like to give I'm it not, to you like you like it. I like it that way, but I'm not a slave to it. All right. It's good either with or without. Well, I was telling the folks, you know, so many folks, including myself, for many, many years, would read Bible verses or paragraphs or something, and we all we do get out of them the English interpretation. Yeah, that's right. Which is extremely shallow, you know. It's kind of like looking at a parable. You get a little bit on the surface, but what's underneath of you don't get. And so... I said, if we learn nothing else in these studies, from now on, every time you see a number in, in a Bible, a number, or even looking at the letters, start thinking about what they really mean instead of just the surface meaning. Thank you. That's good. What is it? That's one of them uh, heavenly hunks, they call it. Mm. They're pretty good. Yeah. Let me talk some more about the the second Yom Kod. Mm -hmm. You know, what's Yom Kod mean? Day one? Mm hmm. So, what's the second Yom Echad? Well,. Let's go back to the uh, Yom Echad. When what what's Yom Echad? What is that? What's it referring to? Genesis one, the yeah. beginning. The beginning day. Now all the other days after that were called by ordinal numbers, the second mm -hmm. day, the third day, and so on. What's the difference between the second day and the third day? order <laughs> just the order it's in mm -hmm. the fourth day comes after the third day the fifth day comes after the fourth day 
It's just where they're placed in the order, that's all. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just another day. But there's only one Yom Echad, because mm -hmm. that's the beginning day. The others are not beginning. They're just continuing what was already begun. So there's two days that are not called by order number, they're called by card number, Yom Echad and Shabbat. So what is it about Shabbat? It's a cease, stop. Yeah, stop. Stop what? Stop creating. Stop the order. Stop the, uh -huh. the list. You know, mm. the list is ended here. Okay. So you have a beginning, Yom Echad, and you have a final day, which is Shabbat. And there, there's only one of each of them. There's no, there's no second Shabbat. There's no second Yom Echad. However. And and anybody, you know, we call your birthday. That's the day you began to live. Mm -hmm. How many birthdays do you have? Just the one. Just one. That's when you start. You can't have two birthdays. You know, people say, Tomorrow is my birthday, and what they mean by that, tomorrow is the anniversary of my birthday. <laughs> right. To say that tomorrow is my birthday is wrong, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. If you're born tomorrow, well, what about all these other years? Where, where's it <laughs> happen to them? So it's a it's a wrong use of the word. So Yom Echad doesn't mean something you do every year. Yom Echad is once. It's only happened one time. It's the day that the, the Lord began the creation, all right? So then you come to Nicodemus speaking with Yeshua. And what did Yeshua say to Nicodemus? You must be born again. You got to have another Yom Echad. Yeah. And Nicodemus, he's not stupid. He's an old man. He's a good teacher. He knows the Tanakh. Uh, what, do you like Nicodemus? Yeah. He's all right. Mm-hmm. But he also realizes, how can, how can you have a second Yom Echad? That can't be. Mm -hmm. You can't have another. It's already been done. That was done clear back at the beginning of Genesis. Mm -hmm. What do you mean you got to have another one? You can't have a second one. And, of course, he realizes that in his own personal life, the Yom Echad would be the day he was born mm -hmm. or the day he's conceived, according to the Jews which is probably more accurate. But at any rate, that mm -hmm. happened. That was the one-time thing. It can't happen the second time. So he says to Yeshua, how can this possibly be? You say, I have to have another Yom Echad. That's not possible. How can I? It makes, I don't understand that. So he knew a lot about the Tanakh. I believe he just knew it thoroughly, mm -hmm. but he didn't know that. But the Lord said to him, you mean to tell me you're an old teacher of Tanakh and you don't know that? What, he, what does he mean? He says, you're a teacher and you don't know that? What's he implying? That it's been right there under his nose. And you should know it. Yeah. You're a teacher. Yeah. You ought to know it. Mm -hmm. Well, where, where was it ever taught? Exodus story. All over the place. All over the place. <laughs> the very number eight teaches you that. You have to have a new beginning, doesn't it? Shimon mm -hmm. et The When the Lord told the Samaritan woman at that well, at Jacob's well, he said to her, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me, I'd give you the same living water that's talked about in number eight. Mm -hmm. Shimon, Shimon et And, of course, throughout all of it, where was the nation Israel uh, born? In the mind and heart of God. <laughs> I mean, on the earth, where was where was the nation begun? Where did it start? With uh, Abraham. Mm -mm. That's not where the nations are. That's in his, Egypt. That's his forefather. Yeah, they were. They became a nation in mm -hmm, Egypt. Mm -hmm. Up till then, they were just a family, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Nathan, I mean, Abraham had two sons. Only one was recognized by God. And Isaac had 
two sons. One of them is God's man. And down the line, so Abraham is there is Jacob's grandfather. But then Jacob had a bunch of sons and other families and finally went down to Egypt. Why'd they go to Egypt anyway? Because, uh, because of the famine? Yeah, they went there to get food. So otherwise they would have, by implication, they would have died. They would have ceased to exist. Mm -hmm. The name of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob would have gone out of history if they had not gone to Egypt. But they weren't a, a nation. They were just a family. But in Egypt, they became a nation. And so that's where they were born. Hmm. All right. That would be, in Egypt, would be their Yom Echad, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Did they have a second Yom Echad? Yeah, when they came out. When came. they crossed the yeah. Red Sea. And the Lord said to them at one point, this will be the beginning of years mm -hmm. for you. Uh -huh. What's the beginning of years? <laughs> Yom Echad. That's your starting. That's your birthday. But they had already been born in Egypt. Now they're going to be born again in uh, outside of Egypt under the dominion only of God himself. When they were in Egypt, they were under Pharaoh's dominion. So they were just like being born into this present life. You're under the dominion of the rulers of the world, are you not? Mm -hmm. But when you're born again, you're no longer under the dominion of the world's people. You're under the dominion of God himself. <laughs> and that's the second ek Yom Echad. Mm -hmm. So the Lord explained that to Nicodemus. You know, he said to him, What's born of water or of earthly birth is one thing, but there's another birth called being born of the Spirit. And <coughs> if born again just means go back and do again what's already been done, mm -hmm. well, in fact, if you went back to Genesis 1, can you repeat Genesis 1 over again? No. You can't. Why not? Because it was only one. Only one. It was done. Yeah. God began the and creation. It, it, it could not. <laughs> it could not happen again. And right. never. The only thing could come after that is the following day, second day, third day, fourth day, and so on. He could bring out of his creation different things, but there's only one beginning day, Yom Echad. So, if they just went back, if it were possible to go back and just do that over again, if you could, what would you get? Same thing. You're saying the same one. Do you like how it's come out so far? <laughs> Not so far. If you went back to the same thing and began it again, we'd be doing everything we do now again. Mm -hmm. The world would go into chaos. You'd have another holocaust. You'd have King Ahab and Nebuchadnezzar and all those guys, the Caesars. Everything that's ever been wrong with the world, you'd just come right back again. Adam himself would have been thrown out of the wonderful position. And uh, the whole thing would just go. Well, so is that what you'd want? I mean, would that be all right with you? Mm -mm. you so want, you want you want an improvement, don't we? What did the Jews call the New Year? Um, Yom. Not Yom. No. Nope. Uh, Yom's a day. Okay. The uh, uh Rosh. You're on Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Shana means year. Okay. Hashanah means the year. Yeah. Okay. Rosh means the head, so the or the the head of the new the head of the year, the first day of the year. All right. And Shana also it comes from a root that means to repeat. You just do another year. You just do a year again. Well. Do you like everything that happened this last year? Do you want to do that again? <laughs> Not really. But they do it every year. Rosh Hashanah will yeah. just repeat it again uh -huh. and again and again and again. That's not what new birth means. New birth does not mean to repeat again what you've already done. It means to start something brand new that's never been done before. Now, the old creation, it was nothing wrong. In fact... It, the God's evaluation of as each day went by, he'd say, that's tov, that's good, that's good, that's good. 
And finally, this last bell, that is very good. Told me, oh, if God says it's very good, then how good is it? <laughs> no improvement is needed. But there was a problem. He said it's very good, but there's something that's a problem. What's the problem? The problem is, is the, uh, the fleshly choices of man. Okay. So man is there, and he's going to make choices. Now, the rest of creation did not make any choice. The mountains didn't choose to be mountains. The seas didn't choose. The animals didn't choose to be created. Adam was the only one given a choice. You you have a choice to do, and it comes down to this. Either serve God or serve yourself. This is what it comes down to, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the God creation, God or you take it even on. though the creation was very good, the way it was made, it had the vulnerability of being bad choices to be made by part of its creation. So whatever that created man would choose would decide how the creation would, would continue to be very good or not, right? Mm -hmm. So what God created was very good. But when man chose to rebel against God, the whole creation fell into chaos, didn't it? Yeah. So if you looked at the creation right now, could you say it's very good? No. It's got the built-in bad Cause, choices to cause it. It fell under the the uh, futility, it's called in Romans, of the choice of the of the man who elected to go contrary to God. So the creation was vulnerable to 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 corruption. But the Lord says, "I'm going to give you new life." And that will never fall into corruption, would it? Yeah. So, That's right. if we just repeated the old creation, we'd go back, to, you could just almost be sure, it'd go right back to what it is, if that's all it was going to be. If it was going to be a Rosh Hashanah, we'll just do it a, a repeat, just do it again. Well, the Lord said, you got to have a, a new Yom Echad, but... Nicodemus couldn't comprehend it because he could only think, you mean you tell me we've got to go back and do the same thing again? He even said, do you mean i got to go back to my mother and start all over again? And then the Lord said, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a new life that's completely different from the old one. What is the big difference between the new life and the old life? new one's incorruptible. That's right. The new one is incorruptible. The old one was corruptible. And so the new one is not vulnerable to decay or to uh, being turned wrong. It just it can't happen. And so when the Lord said someplace, I'll be a wall of fire around you, what does that mean? Protector. Yeah. Was he a wall of fire around the Garden of Eden? Uh, that's a good question. It was after, after they were expelled. Well, not exactly a wall of fire, but well, well that's a tough pro question. If the wall of fire is to protect them, were they protected? The enemy didn't seem to have any trouble attacking them, did he? That's correct. The only protection they had there would be their own obedience, wouldn't it? Yeah. If they disobeyed, then what happens to their protection? It dissolves. So there wasn't any real wall of fire then. So if there had been, if the Lord had been a wall of fire around Adam and around his entire creation, the enemy would never would have been able to get in, would he? That's right. But he got in, would, did it appear to be any problem for the enemy to get <laughs> into it? Not really. Did anything hold him back when he started talking? Did anything put a break on that or stop it or any effort to resist the enemy whatsoever? No, it doesn't seem like it He was. just did whatever he wanted to do there, didn't he? Right. And the, and Adam fell for it. So did God fail Adam? No. <laughs> no. So you got to go the other way. Adam failed God, didn't he? Yeah can't blame God for this. God said, I'm telling you what the right thing to do is. And you know if you do it, you'll be. Remember he told Cain, 
you know if you do with the right thing, you'll be accepted. Yeah. So that implies that Cain knew the right thing to do. What was the right thing anyway? Um, God said to Cain, if you do the right thing, you'll be accepted. What was the right thing? Well, not kill your brother. <laughs> no. Wasn't that was not, before that, right? It wasn't not to do something. It was something definitely to do. If you do the right thing, you can't answer that with a not, something not to do. So he knew what to do. What was he supposed to do? Offer right sacrifice. Yeah, what was the right sacrifice? Was it? What did Abel offer? He offered, uh, did he offer a lamb? Yeah. And, and he was accepted. And God told Cain, Cain offered fruit. if you did the right thing, you'd be accepted. So what the right thing would be, offer oh, a lamb, wouldn't it? Right. Where would he get a lamb anyway? Had to ask for his brother. Yeah, because he, Cain was a farmer that raised vegetables. Nothing wrong with raising vegetables. But if you had to have a lamb, you'd have to go to somebody that makes they raises lambs, which would be his brother. So Ad, uh, Cain would have had to go on to Abel and really say, I need something from you. Yeah, yeah. Which would be a, hum a humility act, wouldn't it? Right. And, of course, why the lamb? Why is that so important? That's what God asked for. Why? Well, what's the point? What's the purpose? I don't know. What's wrong with offering vegetables? It's not what God asked. Well, you're saying the thing is wrong with it is this, you know, you're like a parent that says, you got to do this, and the child says, why? And the parent says, because I say because so. Because I said so. Well, well, that's not an answer. That's that's an excuse. That that doesn't explain what is the purpose of why this needs to be done. If the, a correct answer would say, the reason you need to do this is because this is part of our operation here. You need to carry out the trash or something, or, mm -hmm. or you need to do something. To say it's because I said so is not a very good answer. And the reason why Cain, Cain and Abel were given a job to is not just because God said so. There was a purpose for it. Why offer a lamb? I don't know. Because it hadn't been... Well, maybe he was... What was the purpose of, I mean, there were millions of lambs offered at the temple. At the yeah. tabernacle. Why? God just liked seeing lambs die? What's the whole point of it all? I get, uh, this was after the fall, so it had to be for a, a, the atonement. Or, you know, just the sacrificial process of getting to the atonement who was Yeshua. Yeah. Well, every, every thing that was done, in the, not every feast, every sacrifice every offering every obedience to any uh, any rule or anything was always to point us to the messiah yeah the lord in one place says the torah was given as a schoolmaster to point us to the messiah All right so the purpose the reason why you have to have a lamb is because this is your way of seeing yeshua the the lamb that takes away the sin the lamb that abel offered didn't take anybody's sin away. It wasn't even salvation, but it just pictured what would be salvation. When John saw Yeshua coming along the Jordan River, he said, there's the lamb that takes away the sin. He didn't say, there's another lamb. Mm -hmm. He said, there's the lamb. Yeah. So how many lambs are there that take away sin? That one. That one. But all the others were to be a picture of that one. So when Abel was willing to offer that lamb, he's saying, I'm putting my confidence in Yeshua. Hamashiach, the Savior who will take away his sin. But Abel, when Cain came and made his offering, he said, my good works is what's going to save me. And the Lord said, that's not acceptable. If you would offer a lamb, you'd be saying, I agree that it's the, the Savior, Yeshua, who will take away his sin. And by offering the lamb, that's your statement. I'm putting my confidence in the, in the one and only lamb. So when the Lord said, if you do the right thing, you'd be accepted. But he's, by saying that, he's saying, you know what you're supposed to do, but you're not willing to do it. Hmm. You know, what, what wise teacher would ever say, 
if you do the right thing, you'll be accepted, only never tells you what the right thing is. <laughs> that would be a, a, a vicious act against the student, yeah. wouldn't it? You'd be saying, I'm in insisting you do the right thing, only I'm not going to tell you what the right thing is. Well, how can he do the right thing? So it implies that God did tell them what the right thing was, and they knew it. And Abel was willing to, to take that step. Cain was not. So, so all this comes down. I don't know where we're going. How did I get to that anyway? Because <laughs> we were going to born again. Okay, yeah. So, so even there, it was taught exactly that our life is in Yeshua, not in just being. A, both Cain and Abel were sons of Adam, were they not? Yeah. Which one was the the best son? <laughs> Which one did Adam care the most about? I mean, um, there's no indication. Yeah. Because it's not a matter of which one was the best. It's the question is which one obeyed God. Yeah. And uh, so they're just like a picture of the people of the world. There are those who put their confidence in Yeshua HaMashiach and those who don't. That's the two kinds of people who live in the world. And uh, But those who don't, the Lord said to, to Abel or to Cain, you know that if you do the right thing, you'll be accepted. By implication, you know what's right. Your problem is not that you don't know what to do. The problem is you're not willing to do it. Isn't that what it is? Yeah. So nobody can come to God and say, well, I'm sorry, but I didn't know that I had to be a, a believer in Yeshua. I didn't know that. I won't get it. In fact, Romans 1 says, the truth of God is clearly seen in the creation. Mm -hmm. So that nobody has an excuse. You can't come to God and say, I didn't know. Nobody would get away with that. The Lord said, well, you had the stars and you had the moon, which is the faithful witness. Why didn't you listen to that? How could anybody get the knowledge of Yeshua by looking at the moon? Is that possible? Yeah. How? Yeah. How's that possible? Well... The only sun, the the only glory that it has is reflecting the one of the greater. You, you want more? Yeah, I guess so. Well, that's true, of course. But how could that give any any? Let's say some some old Indian living out in the jungle in South America and look up and see the moon. What's the chance that he would understand that that's a picture of the Savior of the world? Well, we know it's written in the Psalms. Mm hmm And but you asked about the guy in the jungle, so Mm hmm. No missionary ever went to him, never heard of John the Baptist or any of those guys, didn't know anything about Abraham. Take the bag. Okay. So then how could he know simply by looking up at the moon? Or could he? Lord said, it's clearly seen in creation. Mm -hmm. They have well, no excuse. Just because I don't know how doesn't mean they can't. Well, I know how. It'll simply be by the Spirit of God. The Spirit <laughs> is the teacher. I don't know how he would do it. That seems like that, an obvious answer, It would it? come down to this. The Lord says, if you seek me, you'll find me. What if this Indian living in the jungle really wants to know who God is? I'll seek him. Where does he go to look for it? He doesn't have Whatever any Bible. He, he doesn't know anybody who ever had a Bible or he can't read John 3, 16 or anything. Where is he going to get this understanding? I'm looking around. What's he going to look at? The sun, moon, stars. He's going to look at the creation. And mm -hmm. Romans says it's clearly seen. What, be, what may be known of God is clearly seen. Mm -hmm. All right. But us evangelicals, highly educated evangelicals who know everything, we think because we can quote Bible verses that we know more than that jungle guy mm -hmm. did. Yeah. But if we know anything at all about the Lord, where did we get that understanding? The Spirit of God. Yeah. 
If you think your understanding comes because we know a bunch of Bible verses that that jungle guy don't know, we just made ourselves greater than him by our own pride. Maybe that guy doesn't know one single Bible verse, but he recognizes there is a God who saves mm -hmm. by the witness of the moon. What do we know that he hasn't got? The Bible verses. <laughs> All right, we know the Bible verses. Yeah. Isn't that something? Nicodemus said, I know all the Bible verses too, but I don't understand who Yeshua is. Mm -hmm. What's going on here? <laughs> I don't understand what this new birth is all about. Mm -hmm. So when you come down to it, how many Bible verses did he really know? <laughs> he didn't know any of them, did he? Uh, well. He could quote them to you, but he didn't know what they meant. He didn't know the word when he was standing in front of him. Well. Yeshua said to a bunch of Pharisees, he said, you guys are always studying the scriptures. You study them all the time. You think you have eternal life because you study them. But these scriptures are about me. Mm -hmm. You don't see me in them. So the fact is, what do you know? Nothing. nothing. You know nothing. <laughs> you don't even have the love of God. Just knowing a bunch of words is not salvation. Salvation is, is receiving truth from the Spirit of God by whatever means he chooses. Is God less able to to give his knowledge to someone by looking at the stars or the moon or mm. about animals or something else than he is from somebody who can memorize Bible verses? Mm -mm. I mean, we think God can only speak through the Bible. You're right. I grew up like that. So we're telling God... You have to speak through the Bible verses, otherwise people can't know you. So what did Romans 1 mean when it said they have no excuse? My thought is the ones that have no excuse are the ones that put their confidence in all their Bible verses they memorized. <laughs> the other ones had no excuse. Nicodemus had no excuse for not knowing God, did he? No. The good thing about Nicodemus, what what's right about him then? He was still open to looking. He was seeking truth, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. And he got it. I'm sure he got it. But he didn't get it because he learned a few more Bible verses, did he? How did he <laughs> no. get it? But by going straight to the source. He went to the Lord himself, and the Lord says, I'm telling you something you've already read a thousand times, only you don't understand now. Here's what it means. Mm -hmm. Nicodemus took it. Yeah. So. Instead of rejecting it or comparing it with what he already knew. Yeah. Do you think the Lord quoted some more Bible verses to him to get him to see what it was? He either could or he couldn't have. You know, because he didn't. Because what did Yeshua would do in, in his ministry? He wasn't always quoting verses. He was also telling the parables. Mm -hmm. He was making up, you know, creating the new word to to bring home the spiritual points. That, well, he did quote the Bible verses. Yeah. All he's saying is, you already know these verses, but the problem is you didn't even see what they said. Yeah. And why didn't you see what they said? Why not? Because it didn't get taught by the Spirit. Yeah. Because you thought you could know their meaning simply by being able to de correctly define the words. Yeah. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with correctly defining the words or the numbers or the letters. But it's the Spirit who teaches. And if you think it's because of your great study and your and your intelligence, you you just got it all upside down. You can't, you can't do it that way. Yeah. I'm going to turn the heater on. Okay. doesn't take very long to get cool, does it? No. But, you know, it's warmer now than it was a couple yeah. weeks ago. Yeah, we're showing about 26 degrees. Well, yeah. right now it says 29 here, in fact. Just barely below frosty. Yeah. It's barely keeping the snow together. Isn't yeah. It? In fact, we were getting a few icicles today that are dripping off the roof oh, a little yeah. bit. Yeah. That's the thought to make icicles.
How's the how's your piece at the home? Doing pretty good. The young guy, he's what's his name? Noah. Noah. He doesn't like doing his schoolwork. They do homeschooling, uh -oh. <laughs> so it's always kind of a nag getting him to do that. But what's he like doing? He likes like all the kids playing video games, you know, and stuff. Man, he needs to follow Grandpa out there to the shop. Well, teach him a thing or two. You can homeschool him there. I don't do much of anything anyway, but just a few little things. Just things like carrying up some firewood, stuff like that. But you know, um, there was this lady. I don't know. Um, I don't know if you'd be interested, but this lady had a real great idea. Over at work, they have a thing that it looks like a lantern, mm -hmm. like an old lantern. That okay. you would put a candle in or something and then shut it up and then carry it around. Uh -huh. Got little wood slats on the side. And it's pretty. But us dudes, we don't notice pretty things. But these ladies, they, she, she brought it up there because they were tired of looking at a big jar of, uh, of an alcohol pump, you know, mm. for, for keeping your hands sanitized. Mm-hmm. And uh, so she slid it down into this thing, and it fit perfectly. She was like, that's a good business idea. <laughs> <laughs> you can probably sell them like hotcakes. Just, you know, get a couple pieces of, you know, one centimeter by one centimeter wood and just glue them together and paint them pretty and call them hand sanitizer boxes. <laughs> well... You know, over the years, I made a lot of stuff, and people were always saying, you could sell that stuff. But selling is a whole different game from making stuff. Yeah, it is. And, uh, I mean, anything can be sold, but you have to have a salesman to do that. Yeah. And that's a whole nother story. It sure is. And you can make great stuff, but if you don't sell it, nobody's going to pay you for it. And, uh, so... Well, what's uh, what's something that you've enjoyed selling besides <laughs> besides talking about the Lord? Because you tried you tried your hand at real estate. Yeah, I sold quite a few places, but I've soon got sick of that because so many people were reneging. And yeah, they wouldn't follow through on their contract. I got tired of being built that way, and whew, I'm tired of this. I don't want to do it. Well, nowadays, Frank can make up a contract just out of a template. Mm -hmm. Just pop it out just like that. So if they fail on it, <laughs> it's just part of the game. Well, you know, my dad said years ago he didn't, he didn't like contracts. He said, contracts, all they do is bind honest people, and they don't do a thing for crooks. <laughs> so, well. you know, somebody signs a contract, if he's on a, all a contractor li literally does when you got unreliable people, it just spells out the terms of the agreement, that's all. Yeah. But it used to be that when once people signed their name something, that was their guarantee they would perform, you know. Yeah, that's right. But now they can sign a contract and turn right around and back out of it. Yeah. And, of course, you could sue them, but by the time you went through court and everything, all that has to be doing well if you got anything out of it anyway. Yeah. And uh, I didn't just... Decide. I don't even want to mess with it anymore. It's just that thing. It's like, you know, you can't shake shake somebody's hand and get a deal. Yeah. That, that, that's a rare thing in our day and age. Yeah, there was a day when that was reliable, but. And somebody having enough mm -hmm. uh, belief in the character of their name to yeah. not renege on a contract. Or even a verbal agreement, you know. By law, a verbal agreement has no legal backing because you can say, well, I never said that. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, in reality, a verbal agreement is the same as a contract. Yeah. Because whatever you say, if you're honest, you should do it, you know. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it is. And uh, 
you know, when you live in a world full of people who don't don't follow through that way, then not much you can count on. But. Yeah, I think the lawyers have got too much leverage in our world anyway. You know, if two guys had an agreement, even if they wrote it on a napkin or something, mm -hmm. you know, one one lawyer would pull the other guy to, to the side and say, you know, we can get you out of this contract. It's just written on a napkin. Let's go. Let's go to court. Yeah. That'll be five hundred dollars an hour. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, people say they hate lawyers, but they wouldn't be in lawyers if they weren't greedy people who want to get somebody else's stuff. So, what's a lawyer for to help you get what you're greedy for? You know. It goes back to what you just yeah. said with the unions and all. It's like if mm -hmm. you know somebody's going to win big, but yeah. that means. A bunch of other losers were out there. Yeah. Well, you hear people all the time saying, you know, they hate lawyers. But uh, why? Why do they have lawyers? Because people want what lawyers can sell them. And uh, something for nothing. Yeah. That's what it all comes down to, really. Yeah. Even with, uh, I don't know. Yeah. There's. These stories about sometimes sometimes a lawyer will get into a court and uh, withhold ju or uphold justice of some sort. Yeah, I'm sure there are some that not all lawyers are wrong, but uh, there is a tremendous risk there because of the money involved, you know, and everything. But it's every profession. You got crooked postmen dumping the ballots in the <laughs> dumpster instead of putting them up, or you got crooked doctors who prescribe stuff that doesn't do any good. You got crooked military guys, crooked crooked everybody, you know. Crooked preachers who are involved with some of their people and yeah. priests and rabbis. So there isn't any profession that's all honest people. Nope, that's for sure. And there isn't any of them that's all crooks either, I don't suppose. Yeah. But. One of the most noblest per sounding professions that I heard about, I was in school and uh, <laughs> I took a social work class and you know, the, the introduction to social work is there's a lot of people that need a lot of help, you know. Mm -hmm. You guys who are ministry students, you know, if you really want to help people become a social worker. Yeah. <laughs> and I looked at, uh, I was like, hmm, that, that's an interesting thought. And social workers are paid probably less than the people that work at Carl's Jr. over there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I was like, man, that is a dead end street right there. Um, they get paid less than everybody. Cops, teachers. Yeah. Right there at the bottom of the barrel is social workers. And if you got a guy who's a good fry cook, he can probably make more money. Well, that's kind of sad, isn't it? course what's the instrument of helping people yeah. is usually the government so. we well, you know the Pharisees did not get a salary at all they were not paid to be Pharisees Pharisees were all tradesmen they worked to make a living mm -hmm. but most of them got rich if you were a tent maker as the Apostle Paul appears to have been you're not going to get rich making tents you can get a few bucks out but you're not going to get rich but how did they get rich? Hmm. What the Cajuns call La <laughs> A little bit all off the top. <laughs> yeah, maybe a little bit extra. Even, maybe not even a little bit. I mean, you can be sure that uh, they, they got their money by bilking the people. And it wasn't by their professional trade. You know, they might have been... A, stonemason or a carpenter or a uh, leather tanner, you know, 
Simon and Peter stayed with a guy named Simon the Tanner. So they make leather in, out of animal hides. You think you'd get rich doing that? No. But if he was a Pharisee, he had a means of getting rich. And you can be sure that, you know, the Pharisees were always watching Yeshua everywhere he went. Yeah. Whenever he would teach or do anything, they'd always be there and watch it. What were they watching for? Well, it said they were watching to trip him up. Why? Why did they want to do that? He was cutting into their business. Yes. Because he was drawing people away from them. And he was the real deal. Yes. And, of course, why did they reluctantly, uh, I mean, why didn't they want him to draw people away from them? Um, well, because if if they were drawn away from them, they, <laughs> they'd lose out on their income. That's it. They were losing their income. You know, like when... Uh, this poor guy that the Lord healed at the pool of Bethesda, you know, they, the people would go there and uh, they'd lay around this pool and then occasionally some angel would stir the water, it says. And when it did, the first guy jumped in and got healed. What about all the others? They got left out. They got left out. But they kept coming back. Why did they keep coming back? That one guy they said had been laying there for 38 years. They just hoped for a better day. Who told them they would get healed? <laughs> well, it's probably the Pharisees, wasn't it? I think so. And perpetuating. They the... told them they'd be healed, and someone would get healed every so often. Not not every day, but it said whenever. You know, it could be once a month or once a year or whatever. We don't know how often, but often enough, they kept them coming, and. It doesn't say this, but I'd be willing to guess that when they came to that pool, the Pharisees would take up a offering from or a collection for the privilege of being there. So they paid to be there, and the chance of them getting healed was what? Mm -hmm. Super slim. Just about zero. Yeah. And that one guy that the Lord met who had been there, he said had been there for 38 years. Now... And he didn't say how many times he chanced, but he said whenever the angel came, whenever. So apparently there was some times. What was the problem? He couldn't mobilize himself to get in the water. He was so lame he couldn't get in the water, and somebody would always beat him to it. Yeah. So the way it came down is that we don't know how often the water was stirred, but whenever it was, one person would be here. It could never be more than one because there was always the first one in. He would go away very happy and telling everybody about his wonderful <laughs> experience. How would everybody else go away? Uh, sad. Sad, disappointed, discouraged. Yeah. But they somehow the Pharisees kept the game going because somehow they were able to convince people, you need to come back. You, you'll get your chance. You keep coming, you know. And you can almost be sure they charge them to come there. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the point was that very few ever got healed there, only one at a time. And uh, so when the Lord finally showed up, why did he go there? Did the Lord try to go there to get healed, or what did he go there for anyway? He's probably just fishing for men. Well, do you think he knew that one guy was there? Oh, yeah. So he, he went there to rescue that guy. Yeah. And uh, so he said to him, remember that he said to the guy, um, do you want to be healed? And the guy says, well, yeah, but he used the yes, but. Yeah, on but. It. Yeah, but. <laughs> I, I want to, and I know the procedure, but I can't make it happen because I'm too lame. So the only ones who would ever really ever get healed is the ones who needed it the least. The ones that needed it the most would never have a chance. So is that how the Lord operates? He only, he only saves the ones who need the saving the least? Or did he say the ones who need it the most? Probably the most. The most. But not in the case of Bethesda, only the ones who need the healing the least. The ones who were the healthiest, the most agile, the most strong, they'd get healed. Oh, uh, yeah. Some poor beggar who couldn't even move, no hope for him. That's not how God operates. That's right. And the other thing is, you know, they say, well, an angel stirred the water. And, of course, whenever anybody reads about an angel, what does that come to mind? 
something from God. Yeah, one of God's servant angels went down there and stirred up the water in order to produce nothing but disappointment and misery for most people <laughs> and more money for the Pharisees. You think that's what God sent an angel to do <laughs> that, that? No, it doesn't sound like but it. But Satan has angels too, you know. Yeah. And what was the real purpose? And they can of, look like angels of light. Yeah, what was the purpose of stirring the water? Probably stirring up people's emotions and heart. And Keep them dis, coming, wasn't it? Dis, Keep them coming. Yeah. And uh, distract them from the real yeah. issue. It reminds me of a, a Las Vegas gambling casino. You know? Yeah. There, you go there, and here's millions of people that are just pouring money into those games, the poker games or the slot machines yeah. or whatever, roulette. They're just dumping the money in. And who's getting all the money? The house. The house and the, the guy who runs the place. And then every once in a while, somebody big, hits the jackpot. Yeah, I give the big winner a little And cut. when they get a, they hit the jackpot, what happens right then? All those losers keep on... Well, shucking out the corner. Something happens immediately. Bells and whistles go off. Yeah. Loud noise. <laughs> yeah. We got a jackpot here. And so some guy picks up a few bucks. See, somebody's and winning. And all the here. others just go to pouring the money back into yeah, that's it. that's right. And the guy up in the office is just rubbing his hands together. and says, good, pay out those jackpots. Pay that jackpot. Give that guy the money. Because he knows that for every dime he pays them, he's getting in 100 bucks. Yeah. from the ones that keep dumping it in. So that seems to me like it's very much like Pool of Bethesda was. The angel would come and give somebody a jackpot, and he would go away thinking he really won, but all the others lost, and the Pharisees got rich. And, of course, that whole thing, you know, a lot of people read that story, and they think this is another one of God's miracles. Our guide, when I was in Israel, said that Pool of Bethesda, Esda was the name of a false god. Wow. The Pool of Bethesda was a place that was dedicated to this false god. Some of the god of healing or some wow. real nice sounding name, you know. Yeah. The other thing was, it was only a very short distance, so maybe 100 yards from the Sheep Gate. Yeah. Just from here to that Fred Myers line, maybe. Wow. Over there is the Sheep Gate. But what what happens at the Sheep Gate? The sheep come in and out. Well, the Lord said, or, I am the yeah. door for the sheep. <laughs> so when you come through the sheep gate, what are you doing? You're going in through Yeshua. That's right. You're coming in. The Lord said, I'm the gate of the sheep. And so if you're the sheep, you come in there. Well, here's this other place. It's just a little ways away, but it's not the sheep gate. It's so close to it that the Pharisees say, well, it's just about the sheep gate. I mean, it's just a few yeah. steps. Close enough, isn't it? Well, you know, the closer you get to truth, the more dangerous it is, don't you think? The most evil lie there is, the most dangerous lie, is the one that's almost true. Yeah. So if you're close to truth but you're not true, what what happens to something that's almost true but it's really not? Well, it's false. Well, what it's false, but what what's what is it? What is it about it? It's a lie. But it's almost true. <laughs> so what does it do? It deceives, damages, it deceives. and destroys. If something's obviously false, mm -hmm. people tend to shy away. But if it looks so close to truth that it's almost perfect, it can deceive a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But even if it's almost perfect, if it's not the truth, it's a lie. And if it's a lie, even if it's almost perfect, where does it come from? The liar. Yeah, the father of lies. Yeah. And so you can be sure that the, that the pool of Bethesda was almost at the sheep gate. But what did it do? It produced a failure, a disappointment, and drew people away, made the Pharisees rich. So when the Lord went there and told the guy, pick up your mat and walk, what did the Pharisees do? They probably swooped down in on him and said, hey, what are you doing? Well, haven't you ever read it? What did they do? <laughs> I'm sure you've read the story I have. more than a hundred times. Yeah. What did they do? Um, they condemned the guy for picking up his mat. They said, who, who told you to do this? Yeah, 
who told you to do that? Now, what was he doing? What was he actually doing that they, they got their attention? <laughs> he was getting up and walking. Well, he was carrying a mat. Yeah. And what day of the week was it anyway? Shabbat. It was Shabbat, which is, according to the Pharisees, you're not allowed to do anything on the Shabbat. Right. Not true, but that's what they interpreted it. So the guy is carrying a mat. Why is he carrying the mat? <laughs> because he didn't need to be hanging around and sitting there waiting for the water anymore. Yeah. He's leaving. He's carrying a mat. <laughs> yeah. And he's doing it because Yeshua told him to. And he he didn't even know who Yeshua was. Later on, the Pharisees asked him, who told you to do this? And he said, the man that healed me. Well, who was it? He don't know. The Lord had just sort of left him. So the guy doesn't know how to answer that. But later he found him at the temple remember mm -hmm. and uh, but the Pharisees knew that if that man was healed by Yeshua without going through the water without had nothing to do with any angels during the water anything like that what was the risk <laughs> to the Pharisees <laughs> well they're not going to get uh, pay for people gathering at the pool anymore would anybody else see him carrying that mat? Huh? Would anybody else there carrying that see him carrying that mat? Did they see him carrying yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. How many people were there? As many as fit around it probably. Which, it double actually, and triple layers. It said how many were there. Did it? I don't remember. It didn't give you a number, but it said many people came Many. There. Well, when you the word many, what does that mean? I mean and said that the pool was surrounded by five colonnades, five, some sort of alcoves or something. Yeah. Why five? Five is an important number. Huh. I don't remember what it would be for. Well, five can imply, and often does, a work of the Spirit of God, but also implies conflict okay whenever there was five of anything you know there was five uh, foolish like birds five, five wise five stones that david picked up yeah and uh, there were five armies that fought against abraham and yeah, that, all kinds okay. of things that are five but it's also the work of the spirit when the, the spirit comes into the world system is there going to be conflict oh yeah conflict between god and the and the enemy and so Here's these five colonies around this pool. And of course they could certainly could picture the work of the Spirit of God, but they could also picture the conflict between God and evil. And what was going on at that pool was not good. Right. Even if somebody got healed, it was a work of deceit from the enemy. So the Lord went there because he wanted to rescue somebody from that. Yeah. You can be sure that that guy who got healed, would he ever go back there again? He'd been there no. for 38 years. No, he's done. Then his life's laying around that pool. He will never go back again. And other people saw him carrying their mat. What would other people do when they saw him carrying it? They'd seen him say, there. How did you do that? He's been there all these years, lame, couldn't do now. All of a sudden, he's up and walking. You think he walked along like a crippled man? <laughs> no. I think he strode out of there like a soldier, did Probably he? Probably running out there yeah. like a kid. Walking with a poise and with agility, strength. And, of course, the people that saw that, we don't read any more about it, but you can be sure that they would want to know, how did he get that? Where do you go to get that kind of treatment? And you're not getting it here. Yeah. If he had been laying there for 38 years, how many other people do you suppose have been laying around for years and years? Probably a bunch. It doesn't say. It just says many people were there. A portion of many. <laughs> yeah. And out of the many, only one ever got healed, only yeah. one at a time. And, of course, the Pharisees, their work was to keep them coming, keep their, their power over the people, not only the ruling power, but also their money deal, control of everything. And they saw Yeshua as an absolute threat to that. Of course, he was a threat to them. But he didn't come there to threaten them. He came there to save. He said, I didn't come to destroy. I come to seek and save what was lost. Yeah. So that's what he was there for. The Pharisees, in imposing him, were saying, I don't want you seeking saving was lost we want to maintain control over the people ourselves and you know one way to control people is you control the money isn't it oh yeah 
if you can control the money, you got to control the people. Yeah. Because money and people, why do people go to work every day? You know, why is all that traffic in the streets every morning and every evening? Because people are trying to make money, and there's nothing wrong with that. But whatever controls that controls everything about them, doesn't it? Yeah. And uh, so I can be sure that the Pharisees knew that and they understood that. And they wanted to maintain that control. Of course, the demonic spirits who were in, uh, instigating their actions, I don't think the demonic spirits care anything about money, do they? Well, how, how they much probably mo use money as a tool just like everybody else does. But does Satan want more money? No, he wants the power and the greed yeah. behind it. Money is just a tool, as you say. It's just a means of people uh, converting their their uh, action or their strength or their understanding or their, or their ability. Desire. <laughs> They're converting that into a product that they can transfer to somebody else. Yeah. And it's a means of trade, isn't it? So Satan uses that, but he does not interested in money. You couldn't bribe Satan. You couldn't offer him enough money to get him to go away, can you? Uh -uh. He doesn't care anything about money. What he wants is the hearts of people. Yeah. And But certainly money is used to get that, but that's only a tool. But uh, So the Pharisees used that same principle to keep control of the people. Remember when they said uh, when Lazarus was healed, or uh, not healed, but resurrected, the Pharisees said, if we don't do something about this, the, the Romans are going to learn about it. They'll come in and take away our position. Yeah. What do they mean by that, take away our position? <laughs> Their position in the economy? Not only the money, but the control. We'll have no more yeah. position here. We'll, be, we'll become just relics of history, right? We'll become literally just destined to the poor poorhouse. So that's how they saw it all. And uh, so they determined by that, we got to get rid of this Yeshua. But uh, see, look at that guy. He's having fun. He's squirreling around his little rig. He's, Where? He's going oh, that way. one? Yeah, he kept spinning around, losing <laughs> traction, spinning. Got his foot in the floorboard, probably. Is that a Jeep? Yeah. That's a, I'm not sure what it might be, a Honda or one of those little good Anyway, uh, <laughs> you remember back in the, I guess it was the late 80s, where they came out with those little Suzuki Samurais. They were like a mini Jeep. And they were yeah. really popular, but yeah. then they started figuring out that they, they'd turn over really easy. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I never paid much attention to it, but I do remember little rigs. They were tiny little things. Mm hmm they were cool i mean it was basically a motorcycle engine inside of a <laughs> inside of a little shell yeah. well hmm. yeah this all started off with the concept of born again yeah. and uh so it comes down to this there is another yom echad and uh, and and it becomes the the answer to the, the problem of the world. You know, we had a we had a Yom Echad way back in the beginning, but it fell all apart when Adam rebelled. So the Lord says, "I'm going to have another Yom Echad for my people." And so, of course, when when ancient Israel came out of Egypt across the Red Sea, that was Yom Echad again, wasn't it? Yeah, and uh, and and it it's something began a new whole new life, not a repeat of the old one, but it's one that's not the same. It's never been done before. When when Egypt when Israel crossed the Red Sea, had that ever been done before? No, no, never. And uh, so, even their name, their name is Ivri. That's Hebrew, means one who has crossed over or one who's come from the other side. That's what the word means. Crossed over from the other side. Abraham was the first one ever called a Hebrew. He was called the Hebrew because he crossed over from from uh, Ur of Chaldees over into Canaan, you know, he became the first crossover. 
and uh, his he was called a Hebrew, but he never saw that word again until he got Israel coming out of Egypt, and. Uh, But of course, anybody who, who read that would understand. They could see, well, that's a picture of the new birth, isn't it? Yeah. If you're, if you're thinking about it like that. Well, I'm sure that Nicodemus had read the stories about it. Israel coming out of Egypt thousands of times. He taught it to people over and over for many, many years. But he never caught on to that idea that it's a picture of the new the new beginning. How could he know, unless, so, unless Yeshua pointed it out? Well, did him. Abraham understand it? I don't know how fully. You, you know, you've said that before. Like, like Isaiah, they knew the Lord, but how much of the picture of salvation did they know? You know that the, well, I remember the completion of the Lord know, said Yeshua on the cross. Yeah, and, the Lord said Abraham rejoiced to see my day, uh -huh. and uh, the Pharisees said, "You're not even fifty years old. You've seen Abraham. Abraham had lived hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and he said, before Abraham was, I am.' Yeah, and." Um, if Abraham rejoiced to see the day of the Lord, what was Abraham rejoicing about? He knew something. What do you know? <laughs> he he knew, knew about the Lord. What about the Lord? What did he know about him? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. He knew he was the Savior. He knew he was the fulfillment of his promise and what do prophecy. you know about the lord oh man you just told me what you know about him yeah i did so you know what abraham knew yeah now that's that's enough isn't it abraham had never read the book of romans or the book of john right didn't know there'd ever be such a book didn't know about them but did he know what they say yeah that Yeshua is the Savior. <laughs> if he saw Yeshua and rejoiced yeah. with him, you know, when this thing that we call the transfiguration, that yeah. was on the eighth day after the Lord had spoken to people at the Sea of Galilee, and the eight is the number of that day, the disciples James, John, and Peter went with the Lord up on a hill up above the Sea of Galilee, and uh, they saw this strange sight of the Lord transfigured meaning they could see him but he's transferred over into a realm that's higher than the earthly realm it says his clothes just gleam like yeah. the sun you know he just, I just lit up in brilliant today. what's that i just listened to that today yeah well there were two others who appeared with him moses and elijah how did how did peter and james and john <laughs> they mentioned that but Dang how bags. did they know <laughs> that they were Moses and Elijah? Had they ever seen a picture of Moses and Elijah? Uh -uh. Or did they wear name tags? How did they know that it was Moses and Elijah? The Spirit of God. Had Some, to be. Had to have been. Well, how did they know anything about the Lord? They knew it about by, by the Spirit of God because I don't think the Lord said, Now, okay, Peter, this is Moses and this one over here is Elijah. You think he did that? <laughs> no. I don't think so. But they saw him and they knew immediately who it is. And what was Moses and Elijah? He said they were talking. Or what were they talking about? It says what they were talking about. What did it say they were talking about? Yeah, well, it, it, uh, the Lord said, or God himself said, this is my son. Listen yeah, to but him. Moses and Elijah were talking to the Lord, and it says what they were talking about. What does it say? They were talking about his coming death, burial, and resurrection. Huh. His salvation. How did Moses and Elijah know anything about his salvation? They, they learned it from the Lord, the Holy Spirit. 
All right, so they're talking to him about, I don't know what they exactly said in so many words, doesn't say, except what it was about. The conversation was about his coming uh, sacrificial uh, offering. Yeah. That's what it was about. Now, it's written there, and I think that's in Luke. It's written in maybe in another place, too. It's in at least Matthew, in Luke. too. Yeah, Matthew and Luke, I guess. But it... Uh, so here the Lord appears, and only Peter, James, and John saw that. Uh, why do you want them to see that? And then they hear Moses and Elijah talking, and they, they know what he was talking, what they were talking about. Why did the Lord want those guys to see that? Why do you want them to write it down in a book so that we can read about it? Hmm just so, so we can have something interesting to think about? Well, just like everything else in the Word, it's it's there to point to Yeshua. Okay. And, you know, if, if, if they hadn't used the history that, that they were living when he walked, mm -hmm. then nobody would believe it. I mean, there was a time, there was a time period in the late seven, late uh, 19th century where all the so-called scholars were saying yeah he there was never a Jesus that, sure. that was just a story oh yeah and and then the evidence kept rolling in like <laughs> like many waters and uh, you know yeah it got to a point where the skeptics were flushed out by evidence you know yeah well, here's Abraham. Now it says the Lord said Abraham rejoiced about what was he? What was Abraham rejoicing about? That uh, that the world was being blessed through his seed, right? Well, here's Moses and Elijah. Were they blessed to see the Lord? Yeah. But what are they talking about with him when they appeared? What it's like to die. And Not what it's like to living. die, but what the purpose of his whole other thing about his sacrificial atonement. Yeah. That's what they're talking about. And uh, why would Moses and Elijah suddenly want to know about or want to talk about the atoning sacrifice? They'd, they'd been out of the history for yeah. centuries, hadn't they? Yeah. Now all of a sudden, they're meeting with the Lord who's there to do exactly what he'd been talking about all these years, ever since Adam was told, or Eve was, uh, the serpent, that is, was told that her seed will crush her head. Well, it, with so, Moses there, it ties in the law. With, with Elijah there, it ties in the prophecies in history. And so it it, it makes it, tie, it ties everything together that all yeah. the Jews had yeah. believed in for. Well, all in time. Genesis it says that God told the serpent, "Her seed will crush your head." Right. Who wrote that down? Moses. As far as we know, it was Moses. Now he wrote that way back thousands and thousands of years ago, right? Yeah. And. Now he's speaking to the Lord about what he had just, what he had written back way back then. He's somehow resurrected in order to stand up before Peter and James and John, and they're talking about what he had written a century before. Did Elijah ever say anything about the Lord coming to be the Savior? Mm. Many of his healings and things would yeah. point toward that. We'd have to look him up to get it, but Elijah. Yeah. Do you think Elijah rejoiced to see the Lord? <laughs> so when he saw him, now he's here to do. We've been talking about this for thousands of years, and now he's here to do it, and we're going to see it happen. Hmm. So how do they feel about that? Rejoicing. Yeah, and the Lord wanted his people to see that and us to see it so that we can know this is what he was talking about all the way along. So... When the Lord spoke to Nicodemus about being born again, Nicodemus had, had he ever read anything that Elijah said or that Moses wrote? Yeah. He read all that. He knew every word of it. But he had missed the point that he's really talking about Yeshua. 
and he's sitting here right there at that time that we read about Nicodemus. He's looking Yeshua right in the eye and saying, how can this possibly be? I read about it a thousand. Moses talked about it. Elijah talked about it. Abraham rejoiced. Now I'm here looking into it. I don't understand it. But why is he here? He's here because, he, didn't he say, really, could he say, I want to be on the same side with Abraham and Moses and Elijah. <laughs> yeah. They understood it. They rejoiced to see it. I'm here because I want it too, and I really do want it. How How serious was Nicodemus anyway? Pretty serious. How serious? He was the most serious. He was so serious he was willing to risk his life. Yeah, his life was at risk for even being there. Yeah. Now, he came at night so that nobody would see him, but even even at night, is there a chance some of the Pharisees might oh, yeah. know they were. Did. Because Jesus was under surveillance. Yeah. And if he was caught conversing with the Lord, he could probably get thrown out of the synagogue. Uh -huh. And what would that do? It would kill him. Yeah, if you're thrown out of the synagogue, you're finished because yeah. you can have no more business dealings or anything. You can't buy or sell. You can never get a job. You become a, a lifetime beggar. Yeah. Starve to death until you're dead. You'd be know, pushed out of the community. You'd be an outcast, yeah. yeah. You lose all your your respect and everything, and so you really he laid his life down yeah. to to find out the truth. Good for him. So, uh, and the Lord said, if you seek me like for buried treasure, you will find the truth. So there's no doubt that that Nicodemus got it, and you could say he did join with Abraham and Isaac or. Uh, Moses and Elijah in rejoicing to see the Lord's day. You can be sure of that. You know, when the Ethiopian was met by Philip in the wilderness, and that Ethiopian was a discouraged and sad and angry man because he'd been rejected at the tab at the temple. And he spent a huge amount of money and everything to make this trip at great risk and everything. Now he's on his way home. And if we saw him just when Philip met with him, you'd be looking at a very discouraged and sad man, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. And one that's totally confused. He doesn't know, why wouldn't they accept me? What's going on? And what hope do I have? But it says after he met with Philip, and Philip explained who Yeshua is to him, and they came to that place where miraculously the Lord provided some water for him. He did a ceremonial washing there, to prepare him for the, the the Savior. After that, he said he went on his way rejoicing. So the rest of the trip was a very happy trip for that guy, wasn't it? <laughs> and when he got back to Ethiopia, what do you think he'd be telling everybody? Everybody about so, Yeshua. Did he join Abraham and Moses and Elijah in yeah. rejoicing to see the Lord? That's a good point. So, you know, when you think about all that, it's not because Abraham knew a lot of stuff but he knew who the Lord is and he knew what the Lord was going to do he might not be able to quote uh, John 3.16 to you because that hadn't been written yet but did Abraham know John 3.16 yeah. he knew it in other words you might not know the words or how it's written but you still know what the idea is from the Spirit of God Abraham knew as much about salvation as anybody does, I think, don't you? Mm -hmm. How about Moses? Did yeah. he know about it? How about Elijah? Yeah. about Daniel or Isaiah or any of them? Yeah. They knew salvation, you know, and uh, their names imply, you know, Zechariah, Zechariah said, they will look on the one they pierce and they will mourn for him and he, a spirit of, of supplication will come on them from God and there they'll be called children of God. He said, they will be my people and God will be their God. And so on. They will they will celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. What's the Feast of Tabernacles? It's where they go out there and get in, get in their tents. Their what for? Tent. What's the point? To uh, remember the providence of the Lord. Yeah remember that our survival is because God is with us yeah. and when you when you can do something to indicate I recognize that my survival is because God is with me yeah what did I just call God huh what did I just call the Lord the provider no I call him Emmanuel yeah what does Emmanuel mean God is with us yeah 
remember that the Lord said at Isaiah and also to to Mary he will be called Emmanuel but no one ever called him Emmanuel you don't read one place in the book or right. anybody no apostle no prophet none of them ever called him Emmanuel then why did the angel say he'd be called Emmanuel who called nobody calls him that the angel was wrong and nobody calls him <laughs> that he's called that everywhere the minute you recognize that our survival is because God is with us, and that's what Sukkot is all about, yeah. then you're saying God is with us. That's calling him Emmanuel, I think. I don't think it has anything to do with saying words. Yeah, It's a heart attitude that says, my, my life is because the Lord is with me. That's what it means to call him Emmanuel. It's just like this thing of praying. So, the Lord, you pray for anything in the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. So every prayer is always in in Jesus' name. They always say that. you got to yeah. say that because if you don't, then it won't happen. <laughs> yeah. You think the Lord's waiting around for the magic word? No. Remember we used to just play a little game called Mother May I. Remember yeah. that one? Yeah. You can't take two steps unless you say Mother May I. So this prayer, you got to add it with those names. But it's. I don't think it has anything to do with words said. It has to do with the heart attitude. Why are you praying this way? Because if it's by the direction of the Spirit of God, then you are praying in his name. If it's your own ideas, that's not anything. You can, you could write a check and sign somebody else's name on it. That's called forgery. That's a fraud. It's a crime, isn't it? Yeah. But you, oh, I'm writing a check in this guy's name. But you don't have any right to do that unless he authorizes it. That's and right. so people pray, and they think if they slap that name on the end of it, that automatically guarantees it. Right. I think they're wrong about that. And it's just like the concept of uh, of saying Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. Lord says, I'm not telling you, you got to say the word. I'm saying this has got to be a hard attitude that our life is because the Lord is with us. And, uh, and in fact, in Zechariah, it's... Uh, hold up. What? Are, are we close to, to driving or do I need to go over there for a break? <laughs> well, I've got all night. You can do whatever you want. What do you want? I need to go on a bio break, so. Okay, I can I can cruise over that way and save right. you a little time. All right, sounds good. Uh -huh. I'll secure this guy. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Zechariah said three times said the nations that will not uh, observe the feast of Tabernacles, there will be no Joe, rain on, your, on their on your on your port side. Uh, watch yeah. out! Stop. Yeah. I'm hitting the brakes, but my foot was missing. Yeah. Boy. I I saw you. I, I was saw going you. for it, but my foot was on the wrong side of the brake. Huh. Thank you anyway. Yeah. I, yeah. I remember when I used to fly, I would said, keep everybody looking around, more eyes that looking around, the less likely you are to hit anything. Yeah. I don't have a mask either. Well, maybe you can sneak in. Yeah, I, I can think sneak if in. you go right in here, just down the hall of the way, you're there at the art yeah. room. Wouldn't be anybody to catch me. I'll just spot here for a few minutes. I don't uh, think anybody would care. I'll, I'll put a stop on this thing for a Okay. Uh, meet the Midianites, remember? Yeah. And he said their camels were like the sand on the seashore. They yeah. Had, the army of the Midianites was so great, just went all over the country. And, of course, from a human point of view, there wasn't the slightest chance that Gideon's army could win. In fact, he'd start off with 32,000 guys, a pretty fair sized little army, but even that was no match for the Midianites. But the Lord said, that's way too many. you got to cut that down. So he got them all down to, what was it, 300 or so guys. Yeah. And that would just be a drop in the bucket. I mean, it wouldn't be anything. And no, no military strategist could stay anywhere that Gideon <laughs> yeah. had the slightest chance. Yeah. And so the Lord told him, you go down to the camp of the Midianites, and if you're afraid, take your servant with you. Yeah. So what did he do? He took the servant with yeah. him. I'll tell you, well, he was afraid, all right. And... Can you blame him? I mean, he he wasn't a soldier. He was a woodcutter, you know. His name yeah. is a feller, and uh, and he was not a. He never had any experience in fighting. He had no army with him, three hundred guys or something, and no weapons, nothing. Just 
just uh, absolutely incredibly impossible. Uh huh. But uh, of course, we know the story. So when he got done, you know, you know, the Lord told him he took three things with him. What did he take with him when he went out there? Three things. And each one of these guys had the three things. Yeah, uh, they took a lantern. Not a lantern. Well, a, a clay pot. Okay. And what was in a clay pot? A light. A, a, some burning coals. Okay. And what else? That's two a things. A trumpet. Trumpet. All right. Now, so Gideon said, okay, now you. They went up on these hills, and the hills over where the. Midianites were formed a kind of a horseshoe shape. There was three little hills around there, I guess. And he stationed the guys out, so many on this one and that and that. And then he said, now you do what I do. And so at the time it pointed, he broke the broke the pot, which exposed the burning coals to the air, and they would burst into flame. Yeah. And then he would blow the trumpet, and they would give a shout, remember? Now, that's all they would do. How is it possible that that could defeat an enemy? <laughs> Only with the Lord's help. Well, what happened? What did the, what it did defeat them? How? How did it do it? They uh, got so startled at what was going on, they turned on each other. Pretty much, and of course, it started at the beginning. It says he went down to the camp of the Midianites, and of course, it was dark night, pitch dark. Nobody could see him, so he sneaks into this camp, and he's right by a tent, and at the moment he got there, two Midianite soldiers came out of the tent. Yeah. And one of them said, I had a dream. Yeah. And what was his dream? That they got defeated. No, he didn't, he didn't say that exactly. It, it was something that cued off the servant to know that they were under, I don't know. I well, forgot. specifically, he said the dream was that a loaf of bread fell on oh, the tent yeah. and it made it collapse. And it crushed it, yeah. How can a loaf of bread, <laughs> you know, you throw a loaf of bread at a tent, what's it going to bounce off and hit the ground? Yeah. But in this case, it caused the tent to collapse. Well, what loaf of bread could defeat the enemies? There is one that would do it. The, hmm? the bread of life. <laughs> Lord said, "I'm the bread." <laughs> yeah. What does that bread do? And it's not. It does much more than just feed you. It defeats the enemy. <laughs> yeah. So this this soldier, this Midianite, had this dream. It was just a dream. It it wasn't an actual event. He dreamed it. Where'd the dream come from? <laughs> just come up of, out of his imagination. Yeah, that do have come from the Lord. Spirit of God in, induced that dream. And he said, the other soldier interpreted, said, this is nothing but the uh, sword of the Lord and of Gideon or something like that. Apparently they'd heard about him. Those guys surrendered before they ever saw They didn't know Gideon was right there. He was on the other side of the tent. He heard him talking. They had no idea he was there. But they, they had already literally surrendered before they ever even knew he was there, before anything happened. Okay, so then Gideon goes back up the hill with his with his servant. How did he feel on the way going up? When he <laughs> came down, he was afraid. Yeah. How does he feel going back up? He's fine. Boy, he, the he Lord has given us in our hands. Hand. So he yeah. goes up the hill, and at the right time, he breaks his pot. The flames burst out. He blows the trumpet and shouts for the uh, something like the sword of the Lord. Now my belief is this the reason why that soldier had that dream is because God caused him to think that way Yeah. and the interpretation of the dream by the other one was that this is the, the Lord defeating the enemies that was also the Lord's inducing I think when those they broke the pots that the Midianites looked at they didn't see 300 little flame birth they saw the whole sky just filled with fire <laughs> yeah and when they heard the trumpet sound they didn't hear 300 guys blowing trumpet. they heard every angel in the creation blowing trumpets and they saw the shout and they heard it like the whole universe was shouting 
and they were so filled with terror <laughs> that they just turned on each other and every time one of them had come in members of dark night they'd see a silhouette of some guy coming at them yeah they thought he's an enemy and they're killing each other right now Gideon didn't kill any of them they killed each other by the thousands and my belief is that the Spirit of God did all that. And so all that came to my mind when I'm thinking about this election thing. From the world's viewpoint, it looks like it's over. Yeah. But that's what they would say about Gideon's deal, too, you know. But uh, the Lord is not limited by what the world thinks of what he is doing. The Lord is the Lord Almighty, and that's what it is. So if he wants to defeat these guys... That will not be a problem for them. And he'll use whatever they think and whatever they believe to <laughs> defeat themselves. Yeah. So. I like it. I have a feeling that the Lord's people don't. All they got to do is listen to the Lord and pay attention and be willing to do what he says. But you're not going to have to kill any Philistines or, or I mean, uh, Midianites. The Lord will take care of that. Amen. That's kind of how I see it. Well, this road sure, that snow roughs up the road, doesn't it, when it gets freezing. Boy, that, that road out there on Lake Otis is worse than this road. Yeah. Snow's still kind of nice on this road, but. Yeah. But it's choppy. And that rattle right here, the snow ice falling off yeah. the top. <laughs> yeah. But boy, coming down Lake Otis a while ago, it was so rough. It felt like going to shake the bolts out of the car. Just yeah. Rough and washboard. And everything. Whoa! Ooh. Oh. Yeah. Something about that. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I get out and take that stuff off. Yeah, I don't yeah. want to go for some reason. I'll come. That's because it's so big. Maybe it's That's stuck. a big chunk of ice. Yeah, maybe. 